We're delighted to welcome you uh, to the launch of our report about the debt crisis, uh, which is actually looming for much of the developing world. It has been a little bit veiled by the partial return of private capital flows to both middle-income countries and low-income countries. But given all the shocks that are prevailing in the international system, starting from COVID, but also the risk of an increase in US interest rates, it is clear that this debt crisis uh, is going to be very important and will return even with greater strength. Currently, many developing and emerging countries have very high levels of debt service, which is the, uh, reducing their ability to fight COVID from the health perspective and to save jobs and companies, is making it more difficult for them to sustain a recovery post-COVID, and particularly the transformation of economies uh, to a green structure which would be help avoid a climate emergency and what we find in this report is that the g20 common framework though important step is clearly insufficient and we're very encouraged that the heads of the international monetary fund and the world bank have announced they would develop a scheme for linking debt relief with green resilient and inclusive development and we would like to believe that our report is an attempt to providing a blueprint for achieving this. And, and so I think uh, it's very important to stress, uh, as we do in our report, that debt relief has to be comprehensive for all the lower income and middle income countries that need it, where debt is unsustainable, and that it has to be comprehensive in the fact that we have to have equivalent debt reduction, both from private and public creditors. And we have a sort of innovative proposal uh, to have um, credit enhancement or credit guarantees equivalent to how it was done in the Brady Plan in 1989 at the initiative of the US government. So to present this report, and we'll first have two very distinguished speakers. Um, first, um, Shamshad Akhtar, who has such a distinguished career that it would take me very long to introduce her uh, properly. She's had a very um, senior career in the United Nations, but perhaps most importantly, she has been both finance minister and a central bank governor in her own country, Pakistan. And then Uli Volz will speak who is uh, the director of the Center for Sustainable Finance at SOAS, London University, and who's also senior research fellow at the German Institute for Economic Development. So, and then we will have three very, very distinguished keynote speakers, uh, Jose Antonio Campo, Alicia Barcena, and Luis Casaquende, whom I will introduce later, but some, it's something to look forward to their presentations as well. So Shamshad, please. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and good afternoon, good night, good morning to everybody, wherever we are all. Uh, first of all, as Stephanie has pointed out, a debt crisis is looming. G20 has made few announcements, but the debt deals fall short on several counts. It is really in this perspective that in November 2020, our colleagues together joined hands to put forward a proposal for debt relief for a green and inclusive recovery. Besides low-income countries, it was proposed to extend debt relief to middle-income countries that have been hit hard by the pandemic. We advocated linking funds released from debt restructuring to build resilience and a commitment by creditors and debtors to deploy fiscal space with globally agreed climate and developmental goals. Now in front of you is a new report. We developed this proposal further 
as the G20 common framework for debt treatment still excludes middle income countries, despite their debt vulnerabilities, our concern is that we need a more comprehensive solution or resolution. This is not only evident from the highest debt stocks, but from these countries' growing demand to secure need new debt for the recurrent as well as investment requirements. The G20 deal still lacks incentives for meaningful participation by the private sector, despite some of the resolutions that have emerged. Also, the green, the G20 deal is not linked to a explicitly to a green and inclusive recovery, despite the multilateral calls that countries need to push for a green and climate friendly um, investment moving forward. So for us, cushioning the impact of pandemic on developing and middle income countries remains a challenge, while advanced countries are rebounding. By 2024, output from emerging countries will be 8% below the pre-pandemic levels. And we already know that the resolution of the debt crisis will be difficult with the existing multilateral debt framework. So resolution of debt crisis in a balanced, sustainable, and just manner will be key to arrest the drift in the global inequalities and also in terms of the financial stability because of the growing role of these countries. Developing and middle-income countries' growth is critical for these countries to settle their repayments of old and emerging new debt, which is being secured at a time when revenues continue to be low and the FX positions are quite vulnerable. So this, the former report and the new report is all about how to tackle the debt crisis in a way that countries have really genuine fiscal space for a larger sustainable crisis response that feeds into the COP26 agenda and SDG agenda. With this, these opening remarks, let me just present the outline, which is really in front of you already, which talks about the calm before the storm, debt sustainability analysis, creating incentives for private sector participation, and how to link the debt relief to a green and inclusive recovery. And of course, presenting the way forward. Let me now turn to the calm before the storm. As has already been pointed out very well by um, Stephanie, that since the uh, we may have this, uh, uh, right now, a calm in both the economic as well as financial front. But the, since the heights of the financial market turmoil and large-scale withdrawal of international capital from developing and emerging economies at the outbreak of COVID-19 crisis, markets undoubtedly have stabilized. But when you go into the details of the country's economic situation, there are multiple vulnerabilities. Part of the concealment also arises from the rise in the commodity prices and more favorable bond market conditions, which seem to be providing temporary debt relief to secure new debt. Yet all this is masking the deeper underlying fact that many developing and emerging markets will be hamstrung in their attempts to mobilize the resources necessary for a green and inclusive recovery that puts back on track to meet their climate and developing development goals. The soothing calm and palpable enthusiasm in debt markets is very deceptive. 
None of the problems of the debt overhangs in poor countries have been resolved. Risks continue to loom large. And for some countries, a new round of debt issuance may further undermine debt sustainability, a topic we will cover more exhaustively. The IMF is concerned that recovery in advanced countries may lead to overheating and subsequent interest rates high that could trigger capital outflows and exchange rate depreciations that could balloon already concerning levels of external debt across the developing countries. Indeed, a US interest rate rise could spell heaven for develop, developing and emerging markets, not to mention what is happening in the developing countries already, where they, because of the inflationary trends, need to adjust upwards their interest rates, which will make it doubly difficult for them to secure even the domestic debt. With this, let me point to just the example of one continent, not to um, go into details of all uh, the other continents. Here is a graph that tells you that if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, one of the regions with the biggest sovereign debt challenge, the financial situation of many governments remain precarious. Debt and debt service costs are on an average where they stood at the beginning of the century, when the debt overhang was reduced in a purposeful and comprehensive debt relief effort through HIPIC initiative. So we have lost the impact of that, and we have now a deal which has really provided liquidity to 40 countries, but by and large, that's been absorbed by the bigger economies. So this chart in front of you sh shows the recent data on government debt as a percentage of revenues. In interest of time, I'm not going to go further into it, but move to the next slide, which again depicts another problem that we can see that external debt service burden as share of exports has reached pre hippic levels in sub-Saharan Africa. So we are back to square one, no matter what we did in the past because of the pandemic crisis. The last slide that I would like to touch upon is trying to wrap up what I have talked about is that protracted recoveries due to insufficient fiscal stimulus and slow progress in vaccinations will undermine development progress in global south. Already now, high debt service levels are impeding crisis responses and threatening the achievement of the sustainable development goals with poverty reduction progress already reversed in a significant manner. In many developing countries, external public debt service is larger than the healthcare and education expenditures taken together. Moreover, high debt service levels are crowding out the room for crucial investments in climate resilience, insufficient amounts of investment in climate adaptation and resilience will undermine both development prospects and public finances. Countries that fail to climate proof their economies and public finances face an ever worsening spiral of climate vulnerability and unsustainable debt burdens. So an effective G20 deal would be the way forward. And it is encouraging to note that IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva and World Bank President David Malkus both announced that their institution will deliver scheme for linking debt relief with green, resilient, and inclusive development at the Climate Change Summit set for Scotland in November of this year. It is paramount that IMF World Bank scheme results in 
a bigger deal for debt relief for all countries in need and really pushes them into a real climate action that leaves no one behind, as we always say in the United Nations. And I am carrying the legacy of my tenure at the United Nations. So with this, our submission in this report is to help out the multilateral development banks think through moving forward. Over to you, Gonit. Hello, thanks so much, Shamshat. And um, so I will now present uh, the, the gist of our proposal um, to determine uh, which country should be eligible for debt relief. Of course, we first of all need to get the debt sustainability analysis right. Um, and arguably, uh, the current debt sustainability analysis framework that uh, the IMF and the World Bank uh, use is not fit for the job, and it needs to be substantially revamped. Uh, first of all, DSAs have been for a long time uh, being criticized for being overly op uh, using overly optimistic scenarios and underestimating risks. So there are some, some broader issues, but um, very importantly, we like to highlight that DSAs do not account for climate and other sustainability of this. And they also do not account for crucial investment needs for climate adaptation or investments in achieving the sustainable development goals. And these investments are uh, absolutely crucial. Um, and um, as pointed out uh, by Shamshat before, countries that are not able to invest in climate adaptation, climate resilience and so on, uh, will uh, get punished severely by a global environmental change. So countries need to be able to invest and this has to be incorporated into DSAs. They need to be based on realistic assumptions and account for fundamental spending needs um, for uh, advancing development and resilience. And uh, so we propose that the IMF and the World Bank um, in close partnership uh, with the debtor government and also with inputs from, from other uh, um, uh, organizations, including the UN, um, conduct comprehensive revamped DSAs, um, and that this forms the basis then for uh, eligibility uh, for debt relief. Now, uh, any debt restructuring framework needs to incorporate adequate incentives uh, to ensure that the private sector, that private creditors participate in debt restructuring and that they carry the fair share, uh, a fa a fair share of the burden. And uh, so uh, our proposal suggests that if a debt sustainability analysis uh, basically comes to the conclusion that a country's sovereign debt is of significant concern, um, the IMF should make any potential new programs conditional on a restructuring process that would involve private creditors. Um, debtor countries that seek um, uh, haircuts by uh, bilaterals uh, would be uh, required to also seek uh, debt relief from private creditors. Um, but beyond that, we need to design incentives to ensure that private uh, creditors really uh, participate in debt restructurings. Um, and so fundamentally, they need to be convinced that participation is better than abstention. And the experience with past debt restructuring suggests that we need a combination uh, of positive incentives, so carrots, uh, but also a certain degree of pressure uh, so we need a combination of carrots and sticks. And on the carrot side, um, we propose um, that uh, debt, restructured debt would be guaranteed through a newly established guarantee facility for green and inclusive recovery, uh, which we would locate at the World Bank. This facility would back 
uh, the payments of newly issued sovereign bonds that will be swapped against a significant haircut for the old and unsustainable debt. So um, private creditors basically have the option of hanging on to their old debts, which uh, uh, are not sustainable and where they um, face the risk of loss uh, or participate in this debt restructuring where they can uh, get new debt, which are then uh, uh, credit enhanced. Um, so the facility would provide the partial guarantee of the principal, as well as a guarantee of 18 months worth of interest payments. Um, so that's the kind of incentive side, um, but uh, we also need uh, more pressure uh, on, on uh, private creditors to participate. Um, and in the past, uh, in successful debt restructurings, uh, we have seen that moral association and regulatory, uh, regulatory tools uh, can work to get uh, debtors to the table. And uh, we uh, propose that um, the financial authorities of the major advanced economies, uh, but also very importantly, China, um, uh, and also the authorities for major financial centers um, could play an important role to bring creditors to the negotiation table. Um, now, um, we do want to make sure uh, that debt relief um, also delivers tangible results. And uh, so um, it should not only provide some temporary breathing space, uh, it should really empower governments to lay the foundations for sustainable development, enable them to invest in strategic areas of development, which of course have to include health. We are in a severe health crisis, uh, but also other key areas such as education, digitization, cheap and sustainable energy, and also very, very importantly, climate resilient infrastructure. And under our proposal, an agreement on debt restructuring would require debtor countries to commit to reforms that align their policies and also their budgets with the Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. And um, basically, we suggest that the country uh, commitments uh, should be owned, they should be designed by the country government, but under involvement of national parliaments and also in consultation uh, with relevant stakeholders. So importantly, they should not be imposed on uh, governments by the global community. So we're not talking about some IMF conditionality package or something. Um, and very importantly, um, these um, agreements should really uh, reflect the priorities of the countries. And to this end, we propose that governments uh, advance their own green and inclusive recovery strategy, or GERS, as we have uh, termed it. And Countries, should, governments should, should not uh, have to uh, develop new comprehensive plans and so on. Uh, there are already a lot of national strategies, plans and visions out there. Um, they should basically draw on existing SDG, uh, um, NEC, uh, uh, what have you plans, um, but uh, put together a short document that would highlight the key policy priorities for the recovery, which of course should be green and inclusive, um, along with a set of key performance indicators that the government seeks to achieve. This strategy should also include a spending plan and it should be guided by a set of principles that will ensure that the recovery is in line with the SDG agenda and the Paris Agreement. Um, and here you see uh, the principles that we put forward for a green and inclusive recovery. Uh, six of them. The so first, policies and spending should be directed towards supporting green and inclusive recoveries in line with the SDGs set out in the Agenda 2030 and with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Second, no public money or guarantee should be used to finance the development of new fossil fuel supply. 
Third, fossil fuel subsidies should be shifted towards the provision of clean and uh, importantly affordable energy. Fourth, the recovery should be not diminishing uh, the integrity of a country's ecosystem, uh, but help to maintain the biodiversity in line with global biodiversity targets. Fifth, measures and policies should contribute to enhancing the overall resilience of the society and the economy so that it's better prepared for a volatile future um, and climate change uh, really uh, uh, demands us to become more resilient. Uh, and last but not least, public policy should ensure that the low carbon transition is a just one. And uh, so we believe that this set of principles will help uh, uh, debtor governments to work towards achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 um, and help um, achieving uh, a just transition to net zero by 2050. So the government would put forward uh, its uh, um, green inclusive recovery strategy, uh, which would then undergo uh, a relatively brief, but importantly, a public and transparent consultation process uh, facilitated by an independent mediator, uh, which should be appointed by the UN Secretary General. Um, this consultation process should involve all relevant national stakeholders uh, importantly, the parliament, but also civil society and academia, um, and also international stakeholders. And this should ensure that the strategy then reflects and achieves the development needs and aspirations of the country, uh, but also that it is informed by the latest scientific knowledge regarding the unfolding sustainability crisis. Um, the data government would then revise the strategy according to the feedback from this consultation process. And the strategy would then form the basis of a debt restructuring to which um, uh, both data government and public and private creditors would agree. The uh, envisaged spending under this strategy uh, would be then sourced from a, a new fund for green and inclusive recovery, uh, which would be created in the country and into which a portion of the restructured payments would be channeled. If there is already an existing national fund which could be used for this purpose, and of course, and, and we don't need to create a new one, um, and the government would be free to decide how to spend the money from the fund as long as it's in line with the goals set out in its own strategy, uh, we foresee a steering group uh, to monitor implementation, which also would comprise of different stakeholders. Um, and of course, also importantly, the government uh, should commit to enhancing debt transparency, um, adopting sustainable borrowing practices, and to strengthening public debt management capacity and domestic resource mobilization, uh, because of course, uh, we don't want to have replays of, of uh, debt restructuring time and again. So that's an important element too. Uh, here you have um, uh, an overview um, of uh, the, the proposal. So basically IMF and World Bank uh, conduct an enhanced debt sustainability analysis. If a country uh, um, is eligible for debt relief, uh, it develops its green and inclusive recovery strategy uh, where different stakeholders then can feed in. Um, once there is an agreement, uh, uh, the, um, there would be a debt swap, uh, old debt against new green inclusive recovery bonds between the debtor government and the private creditors, uh, public creditors, uh, so bilaterals uh, in particular would also take a haircut um, so there would be comparable treatment between private and public creditors. Uh, multilateral development banks is a bit of a different uh, story. There could be for IDA uh, country, uh, countries, there could also be some debt restructuring, but that would have to be uh, uh, um, uh, refinanced uh, either through gold sales or, or uh, bilateral donations or SDR. Really, sorry, I, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, Jose Antonio, as we know. Yeah, I'm almost done. Okay. 
So um, just a, a, a few uh, words uh, to close. Um, so the debt situation is already constraining recoveries and investments in sustainable development. And uh, it is very likely that we're going to see an escalation of the debt situation um, uh, in the coming years when uh, suspended debt payments are due and also when interest rates in the US will start to rise. And we've seen many times in the past that this will uh, uh, have impacts on, on capital flows to developing emerging economies. So even though right now things look relatively benign in many countries, um, the underlying debt problems, as Shamshad said, are there and we need to be prepared. We need to tackle the looming debt crisis now um, and delaying an inevitable debt restructuring where it is needed will leave these over indebted countries and their populations worse off. Um, and at this point in time, we really cannot afford to let these uh, countries and their people down. So we argue that it is time for the G20 to step up and provide all countries that need it uh, with debt relief and the opportunity to pursue a green, inclusive and resilient recovery. Thank you very much. And the report is online uh, available now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um... Shamshad and uh, Uli for this excellent presentation of our report. I now pass very quickly uh, to invite Jose Antonio Campo, who will be our first keynote speaker. And he has to uh, leave soon after his presentation because he's talking to G24 finance ministers. Uh, so I apologize for rushing. Uh, Jose Antonio Ocampo is known to many of you um, because he has this incredible mix of high level experience both nationally and internationally uh, in public service and in academia. And just to give you a, a small sample, he, at the global level, he was Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. And he was also candidate for developing countries to be president of the World Bank. At the regional level, he was Executive Secretary of ECLA. And at the national level, he's been finance minister and ag agriculture minister and director of national planning. But as an academic, he's also um, published or edited, uh, written or edited over 50 books and over 300 scholarly articles. So, Jose Antonio, uh, the floor is yours. I will then present the other very distinguished keynote speakers uh, after he, he finishes. Because as I mentioned, we have a really uh, embarrassment of riches. We have a dream team of keynote speakers, and I'm very grateful to them for having accepted having Jose Antonio, Alicia, and Louis giving us their valuable insights. Thank you, Jose Antonio. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie, um, for your uh, invitation, your, your kind uh, introduction. Uh, let me also celebrate uh, the, the uh, uh, the presentation by Shamsha Danudi. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm sorry to, to Alicia and Luis for, for the fact that I have to leave just after I speak uh, because of my other commitment with the G24. Uh, le let me say that I, I, I entirely share uh, uh, this document. Um, let me just say that uh, I will have it put inclusive before green. That's my only criticism that I will have called this debt relief for an inclusive and green recovery. Anyway, uh, that's perhaps because of my obsession for social issues uh, uh, and for an inclusive economic development. Uh, but uh, but this is certainly, a, with that little uh, exception, I share uh, uh, entirely this. Let, let me make, uh, a, first of all, a, a praise the fact that the, uh, the emphasis of this document on the fact that existing mechanisms uh, uh, are, uh, are, are insufficient. Uh, uh, and therefore that we need uh, uh, an ad hoc mechanism of some sort uh, to manage the, uh, the uh, rising uh, 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 countries with, uh, with debt uh, problems uh, under the current uh, uh, crisis. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, and, and this will probably be a, a point uh, that I should uh, underscore uh, uh, as an addition, let's say, to this report, uh, is that uh, we, uh, I mean, we, we manage the debt crisis of Latin America uh, with an ad hoc mechanism. Then the, uh, the debt issues of low income or, or the poor countries uh, 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 around the turn of the century with other ad hoc issues. Uh, so maybe we, um, and this is a, a very important point, we really have to have a stable institutional mechanism to manage these issues. So a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism of a stable character um, a, a, to, uh, to manage these issues. But, uh, a, and that's why, you know, I have been proposing for a long time a, a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, which I will uh, preferably locate in the UN, uh, a, but a, a, it could also be, um, uh, located uh, with, a, with a significant uh, autonomy for the decision-making body in the IMF, I think. Uh, in any case, um, that's the, uh, you know, the long-term implications. But the, uh, the mechanism that is suggested here to manage the current crisis uh, is, a, is a correct one. Uh, it, it, it borrows a, uh, from the experience of the, of the Brady Plan, uh, and the mechanism that is suggested uh, a, of, a, a, of a guarantee facility uh, managed uh, <clears throat> by the World Bank uh, is, uh, you know, is one a very important uh, mechanism, uh, very similar in a sense to, uh, to the, uh, the mechanism that, the, uh, that was designed uh, a, under the Brady Plan. Perhaps in some cases uh, it could be complemented uh, by uh, mechanisms such as the, uh, uh, you know, changing debt for for donations of some sort, uh, particularly uh, in uh, during the Latin American debt crisis, uh, uh, for uh, actually for many uh, green projects. Let's say, in the, for example, in uh, in some countries, uh, uh, but the but the mechanism of the uh, of similar to the Brady Plan, I think, is a great proposal. Uh, I think we should continue pushing uh, uh, for that. The, uh, uh, the mechanism, uh, uh, the suggestions or the proposal also suggests that there should be debt relief from multilateral institutions uh, to low income countries. Uh, and that, uh, 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 of course, uh, generates a financing requirement uh, on top of the uh, institutional uh, requirement that has to be managed. Uh, let me just point out that the SDRs would not be the mechanism because uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the one who donates, let's say, SDRs will still have to pay uh, for the interest uh, payments of the SDRs. So it has to be a explicit uh, uh, a, a donation by the developed countries. Um, uh, so the mix of, of the Brady Plan uh, for uh, middle income countries in particular uh, with, the, uh, uh, with this multilateral debt relief for low-income countries uh, is, uh, is a very interesting uh, proposal that uh, I think should be uh, uh, discussed. Uh, and let me perhaps finally uh, point out the implications that this has uh, uh, for the this proposal has for, for credit rating uh, standards, um, uh, both for uh, multilateral institutions, if they do debt relief, uh, uh, although they did they do re their relief uh, in the past uh, during the, uh, uh, the highly indebted poor countries uh, uh, initiative, uh, but, the, uh, but it does generate this uh, uh, very complicated problem uh, uh, that the, uh, uh, the multilateral institutions should go forward without any downgrade, let's say, of any character. But this is also true, uh, let's say, for, for uh, uh, countries that borrow in private capital markets uh, and that do debt restructuring. Uh, I think the, uh, the credit rating agencies uh, with their procyclical pattern of ratings uh, have done a lot of damage to the international uh, community. Uh, and this should be uh, regulated uh, to avoid the, uh, the, the, that procyclical standard. Uh, uh, which actually has uh, made, uh, made some uh, low-income countries that could access DSSI not being able to access it because of the fear uh, of being downgraded. Uh, so that I think the, you know, in the long term, uh, beyond the uh, sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, we have to have uh, a standards, a strong international standard for credit rating agencies 
uh, in order to avoid this procyclical pattern uh, and to uh, uh, counteract uh, this proposal such as this one uh, for you know, a, a good uh, recovery uh, of the middle income countries. Thank you very much. And, and again, sorry to, to be able to, to, to have to leave uh, and now because of my other commitment. Thank you very much to, to all of you. It's very nice to be with so many friends uh, today. Goodbye. Hi, thank you so much, Jose Antonio, for your presentation and for making so many important points on SDRM, uh, on rating agencies, on uh, the need uh, to preserve the ratings of MDBs. So thank you very much. I realize you have to leave. So thank you very much. Okay, bye. Um, so now uh, I will introduce our next keynote speaker. Uh, I apologize to Alicia because uh, she was going to be the first speaker, but um, because Jose Antonio had to leave, we we gave him the number one place. Um, so Ali, we're very lucky to have Alicia Vansena as uh, our second keynote speaker. Uh, you probably all know her with her distinguished career without, within the United Nations, uh, particularly in CEPAL or ECLAC since 2008, where she has been executive secretary um, and performed a very valuable role there, including on initiatives on debt for nature for the Caribbean, which has in large part also been an inspiration for our work. Before that, she what perhaps people don't know is that Alicia is started her career as um, doing research and policy work on the environment. In fact, she was under secretary in Mexico of the environment, and she started her work at CEPAL as chief of the environment division. So we're very lucky uh, that we have her because she really helps uh, uh, carry out this bridge between debt relief and economic analysis and environment as few economists could do. So thank you very much, Alicia, and we really look forward to your presentation. I think you're muted. Alicia. Good morning to everyone, and thank you very much uh, to, to you, Stephanie, to the wonderful presentation of my dear friend, Shamshad and Uli. I really enjoy it very, very much. I, I would like to, to start by saying that congratulations, because I think this document really makes a very, very useful and innovative contribution to the discussion of the debt situation, which is constraining many of the responses of our countries, not only for the recovery, I may say, also for the emergency. We, in the majority of the developing world, we are still confronting the emergency because of the unequal distribution of vaccines. So one, one element that I think uh, you should uh, at some point even maybe mention in your paper that there is uh, so much urgency to close the asymmetries in the, at the global level, asymmetries that are both uh, health asymmetries, access to vaccines, but also on climate change. We have many, many asymmetries and access to, to financing. So global asymmetries, in my view, are, are being more and more deepened. Uh, your, the, the, the paper is very innovative in the sense of the proposals for debt restructuring as a stepping stone. And let me say this, as, as I believe should be included in the paper at some point, which is the, uh, the, the basis for a new global multilateral mechanism. I, I believe, and we believe, and I think Jose Antonio was a little bit saying that, that we, need, we are aiming at a new global multilateral debt restructuring mechanism. And this proposal is part of that new architecture that we need to build in, in, at the intergovernmental level. And this new architecture should include, first of all, a, uh, the inclusion also of the credit rating agencies. And that is, we need a public rating, credit rating agency. Uh, and, and of course, we need to rethink the whole debt restructuring mechanism. So is, of course, this is a concrete proposal to do that, to restructure. But I think it has to be part of a more uh, extensive uh, architecture that needs to be done. 
The, the document has uh, specific recommendations to address the immediate challenges and to enable swift, swift uh, recoveries and urgent needs. And what I like very much is it's in line with Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. And I think this has to be also highlighted. Uh, all, all, of course, critical to the proposals is the, the guarantee facility, uh, the facility for green and inclusive recovery, uh, because this facility has to be designed in such a way that it will also, uh, I would say, attract private sector and the commercial sector. It has to be managed by the World Bank. I hope that it could be also somehow uh, connected to the regional and sub-regional banks as well. Um, I think that uh, the, the interesting part, I guess, is that the restructure pay repayments will be channeled into a fund for green and inclusive recovery. Uh, and I think this could be, there are some national funds, at least in this part of the world, that could be used for this purpose as well. That is, instead of only the World Bank, it, we could also use the national architecture of, of, of banks. And uh, so uh, this, this could be something interesting. This happens particularly in middle-income countries, which I also believe that what's happening today is all the, all the responses coming from DSSI, from the G20, from the G7, are covering the low-income countries, but they are not covering the middle-income countries. And I think you said it very clearly also as well. We are very happy that you are using ECLAC's proposals for resilience fund and debt for climate adaptation. Uh, and in this sense, uh, we see ideas in the document that are very much in line with ECLAC's views. And I must say that we are progressing very fast in case studies that you may wish to use in, in your paper or in future papers, we are advancing in countries like Antigua and Barbuda, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Granadines, because as you know, the combination between private debt and public debt is very different. So uh, the solutions are also different. But there's one interesting thing also, and that are, what are the key elements for successful debt negotiations that we have learned for, from in this region. We have learned from it, for example, that Grenada in their discussion used an instrument that could be also attached to this climate uh, uh, sort of uh, debt sustainability, uh, to this green and inclusive recovery. They use a clause that is a hurricane clause. That is, and, and this is very interesting to use some of these Stay, uh, contingent clauses that could be attached to hurricanes, to disasters, to, to uh, climate uh, uh, vulnerabilities, and, and, and we can share with you some experiences there. Now, uh, the, the other thing is very interesting to, and, and I like that very much, Uli, when you say each country has to prepare their own plans for climate risk and spending for resilience, and I think there is where uh, we, the regional commissions, could help, for example, in the cases of the Caribbean, which I think are going to be the first in line or should be the first in line because they are so highly indebted that if, if we don't do something for them and, and the World Bank and the IMF don't consider their situation, we might be uh, ending in, in big crisis. So uh, as you are putting examples, you know, you, you have very good examples on the African case. I think it would be interesting to include some uh, Latin American cases as well. As I said, we have analyzed at least some Caribbean, Grenada is very interesting, Ecuador, and how they negotiated with the private sector, particularly with BlackRock, and, and how creditors of such a size could come to the table, which arguments could be the good ones. And with Argentina, the collective action clauses. So in this proposal of a debt relief for a green and inclusive recovery, I think we should add some innovative instruments like the hurricane clauses, like SDG bonds, like the um, uh, collective action clauses, the CACs, uh, that could be useful. Uh, then uh, um, I think that one of the things that we need to understand is the debt service costs. 
um, because in this region, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is, has to pay 59% of their exports goes to debt servicing. So uh, this is something that needs to, because if recovery is not connected with exports, with trade, uh, it's also something. And 59% and of their, uh, of the, the debt services is, is, is enormous. So, and uh, so this is affecting the fiscal and the debt vulnerability of many of our countries. Now, um, and as par particularly smaller economies, uh, such as the Caribbean, again, with the tourist, tourism has uh, completely dropped and they don't have any sources of exports if we consider tourism. But this is happening to the other small island development states. So I think a special consideration to middle income, yes, but small island development states, I also believe, should be particularly mentioned. Now, Latin America and the Caribbean is the most indebted region in the developing world. 79% of GDP and the total uh, external debt of the general government is 56%. And as I said, debt services relative to export is 59% of GDP. So this is making this very difficult. And the reason why we are suggesting the credit rating agencies and we have had this discussion with you, Stephanie. We have these two, three credit rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor, and Fitch, which shows that in, in, our, in our countries, we, we simply have uh, 21 economies that are considered high or very high risk. They have been downgraded by these three credit rating. Even Chile, who has uh, such a good fundamental. So, Something has to happen. I mean, they are still thinking that business as usual is what we have in the world. So credit rating agencies has to be part of these recommendations. Uh, now, the lack of international cooperation towards mixed, I think is uh, toward middle income countries is something that we really need to highlight as well. I understand that you are more or less uh, going to low income countries, but Middle income countries represent 75% of the world population, 30 of the aggregate demand, 96 of developing country debt, excluding China and India. So, so this, this is where we have the vulnerabilities. And, uh, and we cannot ignore the fact that middle income countries are characterized by high levels of inequality and unsustainability. So it's time for the middle income countries to be part of this debt relief for a green and inclusive recovery. Actually, Argentina, the minister of Argentina, Martin Guzman, was telling me that one of the major criteria they are going to use to uh, renegotiate their debt in, with the IMF is going to be climate change. So I think this is very interesting. We have to use this opportunity. We have a big country like Argentina that is moving away from fossil fuels or should because they, uh, for, for, for the purpose of negotiating their, uh, their debt. Because the debt suspension initiative, frankly, is it, ridiculous in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. To date, the region, the, the countries that participate in the DSSI is Dominica, Grenada, San Lucia, and San Vincent and the Granadines. Four, four out of 33. Come on, that, not even Haiti, who should be the first. And by the way, Haiti has not received even one vaccine. So, I mean, what are we going to do? Okay, so, um, and, and I'm coming to, to, to the end. Um, I, I was very excited by, by your paper, so that's why I'm sorry to take so much time, but I think that uh, uh, the, the, um, the paper should emphasize also uh, the international cooperation that is needed to, 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 in certain way, to make sure that there is an understanding that liquidity exists and that we need is a redistribution of liquidity from developed to developing countries. And, and, and it's not only expansion, but it's redistribution. And then I think that uh, the analysis of, of debt in the document that refers to the debt of the central general government, but also needs to take into account that the significant increase in debt 
is affecting enormously the productive sector. The non-financial corporate sector, including private and, and, and public and private firms. So in Latin America, for example, 50% of the outstanding stock of debt security issues and non-financial corporate holds, 37% of the total non-financial corporate sector is holding 37% of the total. So uh, I would say that in addition, uh, we, we should look at the non-financial corporate sector that I think has experienced a fall in profitability, liquidity, and, and, and a decrease in its repayment capabilities. This is a report from the IMF. And moreover, evidence shows that firms are highly indebted. So the private sector is very indebted. So where is investment going to come from? I understand the incentives. It could be also seen in this region, not as incentives, but as conditionality. So we have to be careful there. I'm gonna put the example of Mexico. I mean, Mexico is not going for debt and they are going exactly the contrary in terms of fossil fuels. So, so that, that is something that we need to, uh, to, to, to see. Um, anyway, let me, let me say that uh, finally, that what we need is to align the creditors participation and the interest with the, those aligned of debt, debtors. And uh, as I said before, to include new, new instruments, like for example, the collective action clauses that align interest of private sector and serve to expedite the process and avoid costly delays. Uh, the other part that I think it's, is very interesting is the using the Brady, the Brady plan, which is a, an interesting reference and is useful, but the type of creditors, the legal frameworks and the financial in the current context are not the same as those of the Brady plan. So this is something that needs to be carefully seen because creditors are mainly asset managers which behave very different than banks. They have different interests. Some asset managers are not really engaged in providing credit, but rather are specializing in legal arbitrage. That is, they specialize buying sovereign debt at the discount in the secondary market and forcing legally a government to pay the full amount. So what's the incentive of this type of asset managers to participate in the scheme that you are proposing? That's a question that I have. And the legal framework for settling uh, sovereign debts are in lower district Manhattan courts, which imposes important costs and limitation on debtor uh, countries. So uh, uh, given the heterogeneity of debt profiles and debt vulnerability in middle income countries and in Latin America and the Caribbean, a debt reduction and restructuring strategy should have should have voice a one size fit all. I mean that's that's very important. And we have highlighted three lines of action. All indebted economies should be benefit from debt relief or standstills. Uh, and and we are even talking here of high public indebtedness, like in the case of Argentina, 68% of GDP, and the majority of CIS, Barbados, Belize, Bahamas over 117% of GDP. So economies facing short-term debt profiles or high debt service burden should be entitled to some type of debt relief. Caribbean sits, as I said before, debt services payments amount to, 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 they have to be reduced. So not only the debt, but also the debt service. And in some uh, middle income countries, climate risks and green inclusive recovery is tied as well to disasters and to uh, climate change, as you know, uh, vulnerability. So the inclusion of hurricane clauses, as I said before, could be very important. They were part of Barbados uh, debt restructuring. So we do have examples, Granada and Barbados included this, this type of, uh, of uh, instrument. And, and finally, any successful debt relief restructuring mechanism requires, as I said at the beginning, and with this I finished, to modify, to change, to restructure the international debt architecture. There is a need uh, where obligations should be there also for private creditors. Otherwise, 
uh, is going to be very difficult. And we have to consider that financial stability is a global public good that can now be attached to another public good, which is climate security. So welcome your very thoughtful paper. Sorry to have taken so long. Uh, I would be happy to send my comments in writing if that, if you think are useful. Over to you, Stephanie, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alicia. I, that was very, very powerful, but also very insightful. I think you were very right that uh, um, in, in all the points that you raised, for example, on these contingent clauses for hurricanes, I think that's very interesting experience of Barbados and Dominica. And uh, I think uh, we have to learn much from that. And more generally, you made the point that we were right to look at the Brady plan because we were trying to look for precedents because people in the financial sector always work on precedents. But I think it's very important to also look how that can be applied to the different actors like BlackRock and to draw on the bargaining and, and uh, discussions that, that countries like Ecuador and Argentina did. And uh, thirdly, I would just like to stress that um, I think your point about the rating agencies is very important because I think, uh, and I see Louis nodding, both in particularly, I would say in Africa, but also very much in Latin America, data countries have to look over their shoulders at how the rating agencies will react to any, um, any request for debt relief or even for a postponement of debt. And therefore, I think regulating properly uh, rating agencies, as you and Jose Antonio said, and thinking about the possibility of a public credit rating agency, as we, we raised in our paper with Moritz, I think have to be put on the table as part of the international uh, discussion. So now, and thanking him for his great patience, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Luis Casaquende. And Luis Casaquende has had, uh, again, a very distinguished career, both in his own country and internationally. I, I think just to say it more generally, I think Louis is, is probably one of the best known uh, macroeconomists in Africa and internationally about Africa. So we're really delighted uh, to welcome you, Louis. And also he's had an important career in the Central Bank of Uganda, the Bank of Uganda, uh, as head of research, as a twice deputy governor, but he's also had an important international experience as chief economist of the African Development Bank, uh, as executive director at the World Bank, where he was representing 22 African countries, and now as executive secretary at MEFMI. So Louis, thank you very much for joining us and, and looking very much forward to your presentation. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Stephanie. Distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I am uh, pleased to join you during the launch of this report on debt relief for a green and inclusive recovery initiative, which is taking place at the occasion of uh, the London Climate Action Week. I thank you, Professor Griffith Jones, for inviting me to, to deliver some remarks during this uh, occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this report is being launched at a time when the world is continuing to face numerous and daunting challenges as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic, which was initially thought to be a health pandemic, has destabilized our health systems, it has destabilized our societies, it has destabilized our economies significantly. Uh, about a year and a half since then, we have witnessed economic contractions and uh, historically low growth rates in many countries, especially in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Trade has been disrupted, domestic revenues and foreign exchange receipts have dwindled uh, substantially, while public financing requirements are rising as part of the government's efforts to contain the pandemic and protect vulnerable uh, groups. For developing countries, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has exposed 
the debt and related vulnerabilities with indicators showing that countries are sitting on a ticking uh, time bomb while others are already facing debt service uh, challenges. I think the charts that were shared bring it out very clearly. Following significant uh, debt cancellations provided to some 30 sub-Saharan African countries in the context of heavily indebted poor countries and the Maltrato Debt Relief Initiative in the early uh, to mid 2000s, the median public debt to GDP ratio fell uh, from about 85% uh, percent in 2001 to 34% in 2011. However, the trends show that the countries have taken up more debt, driving the median public debt to GDP ratio to about 55% by end of 2019. And now the current estimates show that by the end of 2020, we will be looking at uh, a debt ratio of about 61% uh, to GDP. This rapid, this rapid pace of sovereign debt accumulation is raising concerns among policymakers, the analysts and the international community. Uh, and I think uh, during these presentations, you have all heard that uh, there is this looming, looming debt crisis. A significant amount of public resources are therefore being channeled to debt service as opposed to allocation to other areas that are critical for attaining SDGs, especially education, health and uh, infrastructure. The policymakers in developing countries are facing significant and practical challenges. How do they deal with the health, social and economic crisis caused by the pandemic at a time when domestic revenues have dwindled and external financing conditions remain tight? How do they mobilize resources to meet the other national development objectives as well as the continental and international sustainable development goals. How do governments continue meeting the debt service obligations while the fiscal space continue, continues to narrow? These are real challenges. The launch of this report on debt relief for a green and inclusive recovery initiative is therefore timely as it addresses some of these above mentioned challenges. The report presents a practical and comprehensive approach to deal with key development challenges facing uh, developing countries. The initiative uh, is premised on the fact that the G20 Common Framework for Debt Treatment will not suffice to tackle the debt problem facing many developing and emerging economies. In this regard, the initiative is anchored on three pillars. It is through these pillars, through these pillars, it is envisaged that resources would be freed from debt service in order to provide developing countries with fiscal space at a critical time to address the three crises that they are facing. The health, social and economic crisis, the debt crisis, the climate and the environmental. As a capacity building institution, the Macroeconomic and Financial Management Institute of Eastern and Southern Africa, which is MEFMI, commends you, Professor Griffith Jones, and your team for this report. You can count on our support to advance the proposals contained therein, both at a national and international level. This is the time for the international community to act decisively and not to wait for countries to, in, to, to get into higher levels of debt distress. I would like to mention uh, a few more areas that need to be considered as you finalize the report. Firstly, there is a need to relook at the proposed conditionalities of countries that participate in the debt relief initiative. We can draw on the early experience of the HIPIC initiative where not many debt stressed countries benefited from the original framework, which was considered to have conditions that were challenging to meet. Uh, secondly, there is need for the proposed initiative to provide a reasonable period for countries to benefit from debt relief. For developing countries to fully recover from COVID-19 pandemic, there is need for creditors to provide debt relief well beyond 2021. Thirdly, there is need for the proposed initiative 
to consider practical solutions that address the domestic debt uh, burden in some of the countries. Domestic debt has increased significantly over the years and is characterized by high interest rates that uh, pose additional challenges to, to governments. This is exacerbated by the fact that domestic debt markets are un undeveloped and dominated by a few instruments and institutional investors. Fourth, there is need for capacity building to support this debt relief initiative, especially in areas such as loan negotiations and debt restructuring. Lastly, there is a challenge for all of us. There is need to put in place long lasting frameworks for addressing the issue of debt burden in developing countries so that this does not become a recurring theme. In other words, how do we build economic resilience in developing countries and move beyond debt restructuring when faced with pandemics such as COVID-19 or other exogenous shocks? This is a collective responsibility. It is my sincere hope that this report would also look into these areas. MEFMI looks forward to collaborating with you in these areas. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rika uh, Sekende, for very uh, valuable points that you make and also for your valuable support, offer of support. Because if we continue on this path, we would very much like to, to collaborate with MEFI in, in the same way as we would love to collaborate with, with CEPAL. So I think uh, because time is running, I would now pass, um, pass the floor to my co-author Kevin Gallagher, who will be chairing the q and A. But thank you again, Louis. I, I think it was very, very important, uh, all the points that you made. Thanks, Stephanie. And let me echo my colleagues' uh, thanks and, and praise to our keynotes and to all of you in the audience for, for coming today. Two quick uh, clarifications before I field a number of questions. We have a good uh, 15 minutes to have Q&A. Uh, one, I think it's important to clarify that uh, this is no substitute for a comprehensive sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, but as Alicia Barsana says, it's a, it's a stepping stone in a vehicle for accelerated uh, debt swaps for a green and inclusive recovery, nor do we see this as the only, uh, only solution to recovering from this crisis and moving forward. Uh, we've all been big advocates and noted in the report for a stepwise increase in special drawing rights. Uh, for new concessional and grant financing that goes to developing countries. But we also see the debt relief with real ha ha haircuts and real participation by the private sector to be one of the key pillars of a multi-pronged policy. And that's what we really propose to you today, uh, a uh, facility that would allow for debt swaps for green and inclusive recovery and a specific set of recommendations and instruments that would bring the private sector uh, into the in, uh, into the uh, into the realm uh, in a in a meaningful way. Uh, we know that the a lot of our speakers today just reiterated that the math just isn't there. Uh, we heard from Alicia Barsanas that uh, that we're talking about fifty nine percent of of revenues is going towards uh, debt service in Nigeria last year. That was ninety percent, and that's just to get to the level of of fiscal space that countries had in 2019, but we know that we need a stepwise mobilization of capital to meet our sustainable development goals and Paris climate uh, challenges uh, over the next decade. So without these kinds of schemes in place, uh, we won't have the pair to meet those, meet those. So in that spirit, we have a number of questions. I'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, uh, and the first one is from, is from whoops, he just uh, deleted it. <laughs> there was one by a uh, by a gentleman that that had said, um, "What if, uh, what if the in this scheme a debt sustainability analysis, which is done more properly than those currently done, deems a country to be uh, under debt distress and eligible for this program? However, a credit rating agency still might do its own analysis and see a country in in to be in good shape. How would we reconcile the two of those? That might be a good question for." Uh, for, for Moritz. Um, uh, uh, Miriam van der Stichel asks, uh, how will your proposals avoid that they are fully in line 
with private sector's development of the SDG financial market instruments, which includes many new debt in instruments. Um, there was a question by uh, Peter Richter, uh, which I think I'll take during the Q&A, which is uh, what uh, you speak a lot about private bondholders here, but uh, Chinese commercial actors are also a big part of the debt situation in, in certain countries. Uh, how, how could they participate in this scheme? I will, uh, I will discuss that one in the Q&A. Um, a specific one for, uh, uh, for Shamshad Akhtar um, uh, from Maliha Mimi Bangash who says, what specific and concrete measures might Pakistan need to take to be eligible to this, for this particular scheme? Uh, Motaka Zaiwa asks, what are some of the inclusive policies? We talked a lot about green here. She's echoing what Jose Antonio Ocampo said, who hopes that it should have said inclusive and green. What are some of the cornerstone inclusive kinds of policies that we'd wanna see uh, in some of these? And finally, Bernd Luderman asks, can you get a little bit more specific about what some of the sticks that you would recommend for the private sector? You talk about the carrots, the guarantee facility, please get more specific about some of the sticks. So if we could start with, why don't we uh, start with, uh, with Shamshad and Uli and then see if any of the other authors uh, want to uh, respond to any of them. Maybe more, it's on the credit ratings and me on China. Uh, we'll start with Shamshad. Uh, thank you, Kevin, uh, for those uh, list of questions. I'll just take what has been uh, floated by a, a Pakistani colleague. Um, um, Pakistan has a very high external debt position, but its real issue is with the domestic debt, debt too. So focusing on external debt, I think uh, Pakistan has undoubtedly been beneficiary of the DSSI, but um, it has not uh, extended a request for debt restructuring under the common um, uh, framework uh, debt agreement. Um, obviously, uh, if it does so, it will impact uh, not only its country rating, but also um, the new issues that it is floating will be priced higher than otherwise. Pakistan has resisted to the, do that because it went to the market very recently. And one of the big new things that Pakistan has done is to float a green bond for a hydro project. So it's gone, uh, it's breaking, broken some new grounds and its issue has been oversubscribed. So in some senses, I would compliment that government's prudent uh, uh, thinking and strategy has helped us, helped it to raise issues well before the interest rates are going to rise. And when interest rates go up, uh, it is going to be more difficult for Pakistan to service its debt because the previous uh, DSSI has helped it to uh, uh, repay its debt. Now, one last thing, Pakistan is, an, is in an IMF program. So I'm sure Pakistan is getting its advice from the fund program too uh, on what to do next. Um, but it has recently announced a very ambitious um, growth package, which is full of tax incentives and also is a very inclusive budget, the expert advisory council of the prime minister, whose member I am personally right now, has packaged a very good emphasis on the inclusive side. My advice to Pakistan government is to go big on renewable energy. It has a very ambitious, good program. It's announced its renewable energy policy. And uh, if we can link the future um, uh, debt restructuring if they if they wish to uh, seek for it and if they are able to extend um, their IMF program, I think they need to really strengthen um, their investment program to have more inclusive and resilient uh, growth. They are going for growth, but they need to emphasize resilient um, 
and uh, climate friendly growth. Prime Minister himself has launched a range of initiatives and he's also a steering, uh, a, a member of the steering committee himself of a Pakistan Environment Fund. So there is a political commitment that he has, which will help move forward in pushing for the climate agenda and for COP26 presentation of Pakistan. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks so, thanks so much, Shamshad. Uh, Moritz? Yeah, I think you tossed the question to me about the rating agencies because, um, as some of you will know, I, I led the sovereign ratings team at SP uh, for almost two decades. Um, and I would say, um, sort of uh, with, with this background, that we shouldn't spend all this much thought about rating agencies. Uh, whether a rating agency will um, downgrade or not in the greater scheme of things doesn't really make a difference. The question was what happens if the IMF decides there is a sustainability problem um, and the rating agency says, no, it's all fine. The agencies have no jurisdiction. I mean, there are private companies, they uh, voice their opinions. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, uh, depending on what you mean with right or wrong. Um, but they, they don't really have any say in this. And it's also probably a quite unlikely um, event that rating agencies would be um, sort of more optimistic than the IMF, which is sort of perennially uh, optimistic um, in the past. So I would really sort of encourage everyone not to bark up that tree. It doesn't make such a big difference. Um, a rating agency will have to declare default if there's a restructuring. That's the definition. Um, uh, but it, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, you know, once you have the restructuring under the belt, you have a stronger balance sheet, you'll be more credit worthy, life will be better. So don't worry about, uh, you know, getting, uh, um, getting a downgrade. Um, this will happen, uh, but it doesn't really impact uh, the future of the country. And, and we shouldn't allow certain um, investors to cultivate these scare stories about the damage that rating agencies can do. I've seen it for two decades, they can't. Thank you. Uh, I'll respond to the to the China question by by Peter uh, Richter. Um, you know, Peter Peter asks. Uh, he says, "Gosh, um, how to deal with China?" Because he says that uh, that they are, uh, you know, squeezing countries into uh, you know taking their collateral. Uh, first, uh, you know that that's not true under the DSSI and the Common Framework. China is uh, thus far has has. Uh, negotiated most more debt than the Paris Club, and, and obviously the private sector is not engaged uh, hardly at all. Uh, we see China as, co as core to this scheme, uh, China's commercial, commercial banks, which are a, a significant portion of some of the debt. But to put it all in perspective, first we have to realize if you look at emerging market and developing countries, the lion's share of it is to, with private bondholders. Uh, for the low income countries, it's largely the international financial institutions and bilateral debt of which China is the largest in the bilateral piece. Uh, often some of those uh, sort of basic, basic picture isn't, isn't looked at there. So if you go back to the, to the Brady scheme, the Chinese investors are, are sort of key here because all of the Chinese debt are, are long run bank loans, uh, unlike the bondholders obviously. So if you go back to the Brady era, what, what makes this uh, perhaps particularly attractive on the China side is that China can convert some of those long run uh, bank loans into bonds uh, that will allow them to, uh, you know, after the haircut that comes out of the enhanced DSA, that would be beneficial for China because it would reduce the concentration risk that their current uh, commercial bank loans have right now. Right now, they're very exposed to a handful, six or seven countries or about half of their overseas debt um, by swapping that out and converting those into bonds. They can sell those bonds on, on secondary markets. Uh, and also uh, with the guarantee facility, uh, see the guarantee that they'll be getting that financing back. Um, so we really think that this, uh, this, is, this is a scheme that works for commercial banks, which in the West, there isn't a huge amount of commercial bank debt out there in, in the emerging market and developing uh, countries. The bulk of those uh, bank loans are, are on the China side, but in the private sector, uh, this scheme is, is really key for, for bondholders as well. But China is particular. We would hope that China also plays a role in this, uh, building on the leadership that they've played in the DSSI. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie. 
Yeah, I just wanted to compliment uh, what Moritz has said. Um, I think there are different views on the rating agencies. And uh, um, although he's very knowledgeable, um, he may be, his views may be shaped a little bit by his previous work. Um, so I, I think it, it's very important to listen both to the developing better countries and emerging countries and to their creditors. And though it's not the only factor, uh, obviously credit rating agencies, I think they are an important factor. And it's very strange to have an institution which is part of this international financial architecture, as Alicia said, which has a big influence and which is not properly regulated. Till the global financial crisis, they weren't regulated at all. And the, of course, the initial reason why these uh, rating agents were created and the idea of rating was to stabilize market. So if they do have uh, countercyclical, sorry, procyclical impacts, um, as of course Antonio argued, and it's, there is quite a lot of evidence for, I think that there is a need for international uh, regulation. Also, uh, because most of the strongest regulators are in the developed countries. And as Moritz himself told me, uh, in the developed countries there have been very few downgrades during the COVID crisis because the regulators have informally or even in the press told, uh, told rating agencies not to downgrade developed countries. But there hasn't been that kind of influence by uh, regulators in developing countries because they're much weaker. Uh, and their influence is much smaller on, on the rating agents, which are all, of course, based in the North and particularly in the US. So I think the case for bo both or either regulating uh, tightly these uh, important agents and or having um, an international public agency that also does rating is a complement, particularly for the long term, as, as we said in the paper with Moritz, I think would play an important role in reducing, uh, in facilitating debt relief, particularly with the private credits. Because if not, there is this barrier. Um, we can say that the, that, that the governments should ignore rating agents, but they know that the creditors are looking at it. So it's very difficult for them to ignore. So I think, I think this is an area for, for further study. And I think it's very important that the United Nations, for example, is taking um, at a high level is taking a lot of interest in this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. And uh, we'll let Uli have the last word uh, for, for the webinar and to close us up. Uh, thank you. I just would like to, to quickly respond to, to Ben Ludemann's question regarding the sticks. Uh, first of all, I think it's important that we have a credible scenario where uh, the IMF and MDBs make clear that they're not going to bail out uh, private creditors. So if for the, uh, in the case that, that uh, debt sustainability assessment uh, suggests that a country's debt is not sustainable. Uh, but then beyond that, the kind of moral situation and, and uh, um, regulatory measures that I alluded to, uh, there's actually a, a rich history of that. So during the debt restructuring of the, uh, during the Brady period in the 1990s, um, uh, supervisors, uh, finance ministries uh, were quite engaged in, in getting uh, financial institutions to the table. Um, uh, the IMF uh, at some point held back emergency financing. Uh, there, there have been tax incentives. There have been, uh, uh, you know, there has been pressure, uh, kind of, um, as I said, moral situation, you know, kind of, um, uh, if, if you don't comply, we, we may come, come around uh, for a more, more comprehensive uh, supervisory analysis and so on. So there are ways, and, and uh, there have been also executive orders uh, from, from uh, US president, for example, regarding debt restructuring uh, in Iraq. Um, so there are precedents and, and uh, past uh, debt uh, restructurings have, have shown that if there is a, a strong political will from the major advanced countries, then, then uh, there are ways to, to get the private creditors to the table. And I hand back to, I don't know, Kevin or Stephanie to wrap it up. Thank you. I think Alicia wants to make a comment. I see. Very, very quick, Stephanie. Thank you so much. The reason why credit rating agencies for us is such a big issue is because downgrading increases the cost of capital, of interest, of financing, 
And, uh, and that's the problem that it's, I mean, it's done in a moment where I think it's very inappropriate where countries need a lot of support financially and, and the cost is increasing at, at the rate of downgrades from the, from the credit rating agency. So I think it has to be reviewed. I agree that maybe not to spend so much time on it. And, and the second comment very quickly is that I believe that to have a real green recovery package, what we need to do is to attach to each of these projects, the number of jobs mm. that will be created, the number and the quality of jobs. This is an exercise we have done in ECLA to find out if we go from transitioning electricity to renewables, how many jobs could be created of which quality and, and, and also how much, how many emissions could be reduced. And we have an exercise that if we invest 1.3% in this, in this sector, electricity, we can generate 7 million jobs and we could reduce emissions at 30% per year. So we have to do these figures because, uh, and, and these connections, it's not only sustainability, sustainability attached to equality and the, 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 the master key for equality is jobs that are well paid. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. I truly enjoyed the, 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 the webinar. That's great. Thanks for all your valuable contributions. I don't know if somebody has very urgent, uh, would like to say something. I wonder whether, for example, Louis would like to say something, if he's still with us. Um, I, I am. Uh, I'm still with you. No, I'm not adding on anything. Thanks a lot, Stephanie, and thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you very much. I don't know, Olive, you want the last word? No, I'd just like to, to thank everyone for, for joining. And uh, we do hope that this will really make a contribution to the discussion. And uh, uh, we, we very much believe we need more action on this. And, and uh, this is uh, part of the bigger picture. And hopefully uh, we'll see uh, countries being put in a position where they can really achieve. Um, I, I, I now uh, take Jose Antonio's uh, order um, uh, an inclusive, uh, socially just, and also green and resilient recovery. Uh, so thanks so much, everyone, and, and really appreciate it.